So which means that what I've done is, is kind of collapsed part of the first chapter of the interestings. But I feel kind of whenever I do that, sort of like, it's kind of like, uh, you know those, uh, those versions, those children's versions of classic novels? You know the ones that go, like a children's version would be like, all happy families are alike, but Anna Karenina's family was different. <laughs> they had some problems. Look out, Anna, here comes a train, the end. So that's basically what I'm doing tonight with the interestings. Okay. On a warm night in early July of that long evaporated year, the interestings gathered for the very first time. They were only 15, 16, and they began to call themselves the name with tentative irony. Julie Jacobson, an outsider and possibly even a freak, had been invited in for obscure reasons, and now she sat in a corner on the unswept floor and attempted to position herself so she would appear unobtrusive yet not pathetic, which was a difficult balance. It had been miraculous when Ash Wolf had nodded to her earlier in the night at the row of sinks and asked if she wanted to come join her and some of the others later. Some of the others, even that wording was thrilling. Julie had looked at her with a dumb, dripping face. Sure, she'd said, out of instinct. What if she'd said no, she liked to wonder afterward, in a kind of strangely pleasurable, baroque horror. Yet, having said sure at the sinks in the girls' bathroom, here she was now, planted in the corner of this unfamiliar, ironic world. Irony was new to her and tasted oddly good, like a previously unavailable summer fruit. Soon, she and the rest of them would be ironic much of the time, unable to answer an innocent question without giving their words a snide little adjustment. Fairly soon after that, the snideness would soften, the irony would be mixed with seriousness, and the years would shorten and fly. Then it wouldn't be long before they all found themselves shocked and sad to be fully grown into their thicker, finalized adult selves with almost no chance for reinvention. That night, though, long before the shock and the sadness and the permanence, as they sat in the wooden boy's teepee for the first time, Ash Wolf said, every summer we sit here like this, we should call ourselves something. Why, said Goodman, her brother, so the world can know just how unbelievably interesting we are? We could be called the unbelievably interesting ones, said Ethan Figman. How's that? The interesting, said Ash, that works. So it was decided. From this day forward, because we are clearly the most interesting people who ever lived, said Ethan, let us be known as the Interestings and let everyone who meets us fall down dead in our path from just how fucking interesting we are. In a ludicrously ceremonial moment, they lifted paper cups and joints. The name was ironic and the improvisational christening was jokily pretentious, but still, Julie thought, they were interesting. These teenagers around her, all of them from New York City, were like royalty and French movie stars with a touch of something papal. Briefly, in that summer of 1974, when she or any of them looked up from their one-act plays and animation cells and dance sequences and acoustic guitars, they found themselves staring into a horrible doorway, and so they quickly turned away. Ethan Figman, Thick-bodied, unusually ugly, sat with his mouth slack, rolling joints on a record album in his lap. Figman, increase the velocity, the natives are restless, said Jonah Bay. Julie knew almost nothing yet, but she did know that Jonah, a good-looking boy with blue-black hair that fell to his shoulders, was the son of the folk singer Susanna Bay. Across from Ethan, Jonah sat with his steel string guitar, wedged between Julie and Kathy Kiplinger, a girl who danced feverishly all day in the dance studio. Up above them all, on a top bunk, sprawled Goodman Wolf, six feet tall, sun-sensitive, big-kneed and hyper-masculine in khaki shorts and buffalo sandals. If this group had a leader, he was it. The Wolf siblings had been coming to Spirit in the Woods since they were 12 and 13. They were central to this place. Goodman was big and handsome and unsettling. His sister Ash was waifish, open-hearted, a beauty. Tonight, the screen door had winced shut behind the departing, shooed-away boys who lived here and then the three girls from the other side of the pines had arrived. Julie Jacobson, at the start of that first night, had not yet transformed into the far better sounding Jules Jacobson, a change that would deftly happen a little while later. As Julie, she'd always felt all wrong. Over the year in which her father was dying, she'd occupied herself by zealously splitting her split ends, and her hair had become frizzed and wild. A haircut and a perm might help, her mother said. After the perm, when Julie saw herself in the salon mirror, she ran into the parking lot, her mother chasing after her, calling out, Oh, honey, tomorrow it won't be quite so dandelion-y. <laughs> now, among these people, 
who had been coming to this teenage performing arts and visual arts summer camp for two or three years, Julie, a dandelion outsider, was surprisingly compelling to them. Just by being here in this teepee at the designated hour, they all seduced one another with greatness, or with the assumption of eventual greatness, greatness in waiting. During that first hour, books were discussed, mostly ones written by spiky and disaffected European writers. Gunter Grass is basically God, said Goodman, and the two other boys agreed. Julie had never actually heard of Gunter Grass, but she wasn't going to let on. If anyone asked, she would insist that she too loved him, although she would add as protection, I haven't read quite as much of him as I would like. <laughs> I think Anais Nin is God, said Ash. How can you say that, said her brother? She's the worst. Anais Nin and Gunter Grass both have umlauts in their names, remarked Ethan. Maybe that's the key to their success. I'm going to get one for myself. Speaking of names, said Ash, there's a girl in our cousin's school in Pennsylvania named Crema Siemens. <laughs> you made that up, Kathy said. No, I did not. Crema Siemens, Ethan repeated thoughtfully. I it's like a flavor of Campbell's soup that got discontinued immediately. <laughs> now let us all observe a moment of silence for the tragic life of Crema Siemens, Julie heard herself say. She hadn't planned to say a word tonight, and as soon as she spoke, she felt she'd made a mistake. Jacobson speaks, said Goodman. Jacobson. She was excited to hear him call her that, though it was hardly what she'd imagined a boy might ever call her. Julie didn't even know what she was doing as she lifted her cup again. Oh, Crema Siemens, wherever thou art, she said loudly, your life will be terrible. It will be cut short by an accident involving animal desemonizing equipment. This was a nonsensical remark, but there were approval sounds from around the teepee. See, I knew there was a reason I invited her in, said Ash, turning to the others. Go, Jules. Jules. There it was, right there, the effortless shift that made all the difference. She was Jules suddenly, and she would be Jules forever. They had only a little over an hour together, and then one of the counselors on patrol, a blunt-haired weaving instructor and lifeguard from Iceland named Gudrun Sigurd's daughter, came into the teepee with a bulky flashlight that looked as if it were meant to be used during night ice fishing. She peered around and said, all right, my young friends, I can tell that you have been smoking pot. That is not cool, though you may think it is. Well, said Goodman, now that you've made us see the error of our ways, it'll never happen again. <laughs> that is very nice, but break this up now, and all you girls, please go back through the pines. So the three girls left, heading away from the teepee in a slow, easy herd with their flashlights leading them. Out on the path, someone called out to her. It was Ethan, and she stopped while the other girls kept walking ahead. Can I show you something, he asked. She let herself be led down the hill toward the animation shed. Ethan Figman opened the unlocked door. Inside, the shed smelled plasticky, slightly scorched, and he threw on the fluorescent lights. Ethan threaded a projector, then shut off the lights. A cartoon sprang up on a sheeted wall. Figland read the credits, and antic characters began to prance and splat and jabber. The characters in Figland were alternately wormy, leering, and adorable, while in the excess light from the projector, Ethan himself was touchingly ugly, with a raw sheath of arm skin etched with its own ugly dermatological cartoon. On Figland, characters rode trolleys, played the accordion, and a few of them broke into the Figman Gate Hotel. No wonder Ethan was beloved here at camp. He was a genius, she saw now. The cartoon came to an end, and the film flip-flapped on its reel. God, Ethan, Jules said to him, it's totally original, I love it. What do you know, he said in a soft, husky voice, you love it, Jules Jacobson loves it. Just as she was enjoying hearing the strange name said aloud, Ethan thrust his big head toward hers. His mouth attached itself to her mouth. She'd already been aware that he smelled of pot, but up against her, he smelled much worse, mushroomy, <laughs> feverish, overripe. She yanked her head back and said, wait, what? Then, I'm really sorry, she added. Forget it, Ethan said hoarsely. Forget it, you have nothing to feel sorry about. I think I'll find a way to live. I mean, people have been rejected by other people since the dawn of time. <laughs> I've never rejected anyone in my life, Jules said fiercely. Although, she added, I've never accepted anyone either. What I mean is it's never been an issue. He stayed by her side as they left the animation shed and trudged back up the hill together. When they reached the top, he said, you say you haven't accepted or rejected anyone. You are 100% inexperienced. So maybe, maybe you're just nervous. Your nervousness could be masking your real feelings for me. 
You think so, she asked, doubtful. Could be, he said, so I have a proposition for you. Reconsider. It was such a reasonable request. She could spend a lot more time with Ethan Figman, experimenting with the idea of being part of a couple. All right, she told him, she would reconsider. In the girl's teepee, Ash Wolf was already in bed. So where were you, Ash asked. Oh, Ethan Figman wanted to show me one of his films, and then we started talking, and it, it got kind of strange. It's hard to explain. I know what they're like, Ash said. What? Those moments of strangeness. Life is full of them. She got out of her own bed and came to sit beside Jules. I've always sort of felt that you prepare yourself over the course of your whole life for the big moments. But when they happen, you sometimes feel totally unready for them, or even that they're not what you thought. And that's what makes them strange. That's true, Jules said. That's just what happened to me. A first kiss, Jules had thought, was supposed to magnetize you to the other person. The magnet and the metal were meant to fuse and melt on contact into a sizzling brew of silver and red. But this kiss had done nothing like that. Jules would have liked to tell Ash all about it now. But Kathy Kiplinger was right there, and Jane Zell, and somber-faced Nancy Mangieri, who sometimes played the cello as if she were performing at the funeral of a child. <laughs> if it were just Jules and Ash, she would have told her everything. But the other girls began passing around a huckleberry crumble purchased at the bakery in town that day, and a warped fork from the dining hall. Someone said, God, it tastes like sex, and everyone laughed, including Jules, who wondered if sex, when it was really good, actually offered the pleasures of a huckleberry crumble. The subject of Ethan Figman was now lost for the night. The crumble went around a few more times, and everyone's lips became tribally blue, and all the girls felt fired up, overstimulated. Their laughter, drifting from the teepee and scribbling among the trees, headed toward the boys, a message in the darkness before lockdown. Over the following weeks, Jules and Ethan spent a great deal of time alone together. Once, sitting with him by the swimming pool at dusk, she told him about her father's death. Wow, he was 42, Ethan said. Jesus, Jules, that's so young. And it's just so sad that you'll never see him again. He was your dad. He probably used to sing you all these little songs, am I right? No, said Jules. She let her fingers drape through the cold water. But then suddenly she remembered that her father had sung her one song once. Yes, she said, surprised. Yes, he did. It was a folk song. Which one? She began to sing in an unsteady voice. Just a little rain falling all around. The grass lifts its head to the heavenly sound. Just a little rain, just a little rain. What have they done to the rain? Just a little boy standing in the rain, the gentle rain that falls for years, and the grass is gone, the boy disappears, and rain keeps falling like helpless tears. And what have they done to the rain? When she was finished, Ethan kept looking at her. That killed me, he said. You know what that song's about, right? Acid rain, she said. He shook his head, no, nuclear testing. Your dad was political? No, he wasn't, said Jules. But she thought of how she hadn't known her father all that well. She'd almost never asked him anything about himself. He was thin, fair-haired, burdened, and now he was dead at 42. So then she and Ethan were crying together, which led to inevitable kissing, which wasn't nearly as bad this time, because they both tasted identically of mucus. It didn't matter to her that she didn't feel excited. Instead, she felt mostly desperate. One night, the entire camp was instructed to gather on the lawn. No other information was given. Ethan and Jules sat together on a blanket on the hill. He lay on his back with his head in her lap, looking up at the darkening sky and the jumpy Japanese lanterns strung on wires between trees. The camp owner, Manny Wunderlich, appeared before them and said, hello, everyone, hello. I'd like to introduce a very special surprise guest. Jules craned to see a woman in a sunset-colored poncho carrying a guitar by its neck. It was Jonah's folk singer mother, Susanna Bay. In person, she was beautiful in the way of very few mothers, her hair long and black and straight. Good evening, spirit in the woods, said the folk singer into a microphone when everyone was quiet. Are you having a great summer? A series of affirmative calls rose up. Then she strummed hard on her guitar and began to sing her signature song, the wind will carry us. 
After the performance, which was full of feeling and well-received, everyone stood around and ladled up pink punch from a big metal bowl. Tiny fruit flies twittered on the surface of the punch. Ethan lightly dropped his arm down upon Jules's shoulder. The way Susanna sings, the wind will carry us, is so sad, he murmured. Yeah, it really is, she said. It makes me think of the way people devote their lives to each other, he said, and then one of them just leaves or dies. He was somber watching her, seeing if the melancholy mood could make her respond to him again. He wrapped his arms around her and Jules willed herself to want him, for he was brilliant and funny and would always be kind to her and would always be ardent. But all she could feel was that he was her wonderful and gifted friend. I can't keep trying, she said, all in a flood, unplanned. Ethan, it's not what I want to do. You don't know what you want, he said, a little frantic. You're confused, Jules. You've had a major loss this year. You're still feeling it in stages. You know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and all that. Hey, he added, she's got an umlaut, too. <laughs> no, this isn't about my father, okay, Jules said. Galloping into the lantern light at that moment came Goodman Wolf, along with a pouting ceramicist from Girls TP4, who always had clay under her fingernails. They stopped on the edge of the circle, and the girl tipped her head up toward his, and Goodman leaned down, and then they kissed. Jules watched as Goodman's mouth pulled away with what she could swear she saw, even from a distance, a smear of the girl's colorless lip gloss on his lips, like butter, like a prize. Jules was suffused with a blast of sensation, like the light from Ethan's projector. Feelings could come over you in a sudden, wild sweep. She could never, ever love Ethan Figman. It would have been exciting to love Goodman Wolf, of course, but that wasn't going to happen either, ever. That kind of wild and beautiful boy could not love a plain girl. There would be no pairing off of any kind this summer, no passionate subsets formed, and though in some ways this was sad, in other ways it was such a relief, for now they could all return to the boys' teepee, the six of them, and take their places in that perfect, unbroken, lifelong circle. The whole teepee would quake in preparation for liftoff, as though their kind of irony and their kind of conversation and heightened friendship was so strong it could actually make a small wooden building rise up and hover briefly above the earth. Thank you. Thank you.